I want to welcome everyone and, and thanks again for joining us for today's Sight and Sound Bites webinar. Today's topic is living with tinnitus, clinical evaluation and management strategies. And our speaker is Dr. Lori Zatelli, managing audiologist in the UPMC Department of Audiology. So the Eye and Ear Foundation hosts the Sight and Sound Bite webinars each month featuring different topics related to vision loss, hearing loss, head and neck cancer, sinus, allergy, balance disorders, and conditions of the voice. Uh, my name is Carrie Fogel, and I'm the Director of Development and Foundation Relations at the Ioneer Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So before we get started, um, I just want to go over a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, if you can see at the bottom of your screen, we won't be using the chat function during today's webinar. But if you do have a question, we ask that you submit your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I will round up all the questions during the presentation and after, and I will be asking them of Lori uh, when she's done presenting. Um, we ask that you do keep your questions general and not ask about very specific personal health conditions that might not be relevant to the larger audience. Uh, and I also wanna note that we will not be reading individual names. Please submit questions at any time through the program and we'll make sure to ask them at the end. And if there are any questions that we don't have time to answer, we will send those to Dr. Zatelli and answers can be sent directly to you via email um, if you've asked them. And I wanna note that there will also be a video of today's discussion available on the IENIR Foundation website in a couple of days. So with that, I'd like to welcome our speaker today. Dr. Lori Zatelli joined the Department of Audiology at UPMC in 2012, and she became managing audiologist in 2021. She received her clinical doctorate in audiology from the University of Pittsburgh, where she is also an adjunct instructor. Her special interests include evaluation and treatment of tinnitus and decreased sound tolerance, amplification, clinical education, clinical research, and interventional audiology. She is also an active member of the American Academy of Audiology and enjoys volunteering for this organization as well. So thank you, Lori, for joining us. I'm really excited for your presentation and to hear all about some uh, management strategies for tinnitus. Thank you so much, Carrie. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I just wanna start by telling you a little bit about myself um, so that you know what I'm doing here today. So as Carrie mentioned, I am the managing audiologist in our department. And I have been heading up our tinnitus retraining therapy program for about eight years now. So the audiologist who was doing this before me was the great Randall Kesterson, and he had begun our tinnitus retraining therapy program in this department sometime in the early 90s. And um, when he retired, he passed the torch to me, and we've been seeing and evaluating and helping people cope with tinnitus ever since. So I am also as Carrie mentioned, an adjunct, adjunct instructor at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm pleased to tell you all that as of this summer, there is now a tinnitus course being taught uh, to AUD students at the University of Pittsburgh. And we're focusing on evaluation and treatment of tinnitus and decreased sound tolerance, which is a closely related topic area. I am also a research audiologist with the, with the Pittsburgh Hearing Research Center. And uh, I know you've heard some previous webinars from some of the researchers who are involved, heavily involved there. And they're doing a lot of really important work and it's a pleasure to be involved as well. I am a trustee of the American Academy of Audiology Foundation who do a lot of good work just like the Eye and Ear Foundation. And lastly, I am a certificate holder in tinnitus management. This is a certificate program that's provided by the American Board of Audiology. Um, and I did earn that certification um, recently. So this is me in a nutshell. And over the next couple of minutes, we're gonna spend some time thinking about evaluation and management of tinnitus and how a lot of people are able to do that successfully, um, either by themselves over time or with a little bit of help from us. So let's first start by thinking about what tinnitus is. So tinnitus can be described as a phantom auditory perception that's not related to any external sounds in the environment. So tinnitus is a perception. It's a sound that people hear, um, sometimes within their ears, sometimes within the, they feel like it's in their head. And it's not linked to any sounds in the environment. There's no vibratory activity in their inner ear that's linked to it. It's simply a perception. 
So many people report that tinnitus sounds like ringing um, or like a tone. A lot of people say that it sounds like buzzing, humming, hissing, chirping, whooshing. We hear all of these descriptions and all of them would be considered forms of tinnitus. The problem when it comes to evaluating and managing tinnitus, the big problem I would say, is that we don't necessarily know exactly where it comes from for everyone. And there are a lot of places within the ears and the brain that tinnitus could be generated. Um, but what we know from the research is that people who have tinnitus are not a homogenous group. There are a lot of different things that can cause it. There are a lot of different things that do cause it. So the early theories related to where tinnitus came from focused on the ears. So it was all about hearing loss in the peripheral hearing system in the ears. Um, as we learned a little bit more about it and how the other systems in the brain can become involved, the next round of theories started to focus more on the brain. And now most people who think a lot about this believe that although tinnitus might originate um, in the, the it, there might be uh, places in the ears where the tinnitus is thought to be originated. Really, most of what happens is focused on the brain and the central auditory systems. So even when hearing damage could be the triggering factor for the generation of the tinnitus, most of what we're focusing on is actually happening in the brain. We know there are multiple risk factors for tinnitus. So these would be things that would make someone more likely to develop tinnitus over time. And one of the most common things that we think about is hearing loss. So we know that when people have some form of hearing loss, and there are different types of hearing loss that can be caused by different kinds of things, they are more likely to develop tinnitus over time. Noise exposure is another big risk factor. So we hear a lot of stories from people who have experienced noise over their life during different um, activities or different time points, and many of them report tinnitus. So some of the big groups of individuals that we think about related to noise exposure would be musicians, um, dentists, a lot of times because the drilling and it happens so close to their heads, um, construction workers who are exposed to loud noises from power tools consistently, hunters or people who are using um, gun, guns and shooting guns and service members and veterans tend to be a lot of, around a lot of noises. So the thing that can be tricky with noise exposure is that it's not just about the sound that you're exposed to, it's also about how long you're listening to it. So if you're listening to a sound that's not very, very loud, uh, you can listen to it for a long time because it's safe over that amount of time. If you're listening to something that's extremely loud, the amount of time that you can listen to it is gonna be much shorter safely. So those two things are really important there and that's, called, that's considered the dose. So how loud it is and how long you're listening to it. The next thing we think about is that certain, certain medications, pharmaceuticals, drugs can be linked to hearing loss and tinnitus. There are a couple of specific classes of medications that we think about. So certain types of chemotherapy agents, certain types of diuretics, certain types of antibiotics. Um, but really, if you take any medication in the world and you look far enough down on the list of possible side effects, you're likely to see tinnitus somewhere on that list. It's just whether it's, you know, how likely it is that that's gonna happen. But really the three groups that I mentioned are the ones that, are, that we're thinking about the most. Um, and age is a risk factor for tinnitus. So over time, and I think hearing loss is, is uh, linked to this as well. So we know that over time, you're more likely to develop hearing loss and a link to that would be over time, you're more likely to develop tinnitus as well. And then lastly, high stress levels. We know that when people are under significant levels of stress, their ability to cope with things becomes compromised because they're being pulled in so many different directions. So if you think of your brain as a pie chart, the amount of resources and energy and cognitive um, resources that you have that you can expend toward things that are bothersome to you is going to be reduced when you're under significant amounts of stress. The thing to know is that bothersome tinnitus typically is treatable. And I think many people are told the opposite, which can be discouraging and actually in some cases can lead someone who's not bothered by their tinnitus to become bothered by it. So the type of tinnitus that you have is going to determine who can treat your tinnitus. So when we think about dividing tinnitus into categories, we consider it either primary or secondary. So we'll start with primary. Primary tinnitus is something that can be treated by an audiologist. 
it's called primary because there's not some sort of underlying medical condition that's causing it. So it's typically associated with a type of hearing loss called sensory neural hearing loss. So that's the SNHL that you see on that screen there. The word that people use typically to describe this type of tinnitus is idiopathic. That means we don't we don't necessarily know exactly what's causing it. It's, it's kind of one of these things that's not linked to something specific underlying it, um, aside from sensory neural hearing loss. There's, there's no cure for this type of tinnitus. And when we say that, what we mean is there's no pill that someone will give you or a surgical procedure that someone will do that will eliminate the tinnitus entirely. So management of this type of tinnitus really focuses on what we call habituation. So we're gonna come back to that in a later slide. So habituation is the process of your brain learning to tune things out over time. And a lot of people are able to do that very successfully with their tinnitus when it's primary tinnitus. So the other type of tinnitus would be considered secondary tinnitus. This would be the kind of tinnitus that would need to be treated by a physician. So the reason it's secondary is because it's, it's secondary or associated to another specific disorder or cause some sort of condition other than sensory neural hearing loss, which is related to, to inner ear hearing loss. So the management in this case would be related to treating the underlying condition. So sometimes there are types of hearing loss or types of ear problems that can be managed medically or surgically or pharmaceutically. Um, so in that case, the treatment that would be effective would be coming from the physician. So if you want to pursue an evaluation for your tinnitus, the first step would be to, to be seen by an ear, nose, and throat physician. And we have many awesome providers at UPMC. So if you see someone at UPMC, you can be confident that you're gonna be receiving an evidence-based approach to the evaluation of your tinnitus. There are guidelines out there that are available um, that I, I am confident that our physicians are following. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with a QR code. This, you can think of it as a visual link. So if you take your, your cell phone uh, camera and you point it at this black and white box you see on the screen, a link is gonna pop up. So you open your camera app, you hold it in front of this box and then you hold it for there for a second, a link will pop up that, that you can then tap with your finger and it will take you directly to the page where it has all the information for all of our different office locations. So feel free to do that. I'm gonna linger on this slide for just a second before I move on. Um, but otherwise, if you miss this or if you don't want to do this right now, UPMC has many different office locations where you can be evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat physician for your tinnitus. And together, you guys will determine what the most appropriate course of action will be for you. Following that appointment with a physician, you are likely to be evaluated by an audiologist. So the process related to that will look something like this. So there are guidelines related to this as well that we're going to be following. And the first step is for us to ask you, basically, we're going to give you the third degree. We want to know everything about your tinnitus that you can tell us. We want to know when it started, if you feel like there's anything that, it, you know, that caused it. Um, we want to know what parts of your life are impacted by the tinnitus and how they impact you. So we're going to ask you a lot of questions. We're going to be asking you to rank things on a scale from zero to 10. We're going to be asking you what percentage of times you notice things, things like that. The next part of that evaluation is to go through some questionnaires. So you're gonna be given a piece of paper that asks you some more specific questions. And the reason we like to use these is because they're validated. They go through a process that let us know that these questions are really important to know as we're trying to evaluate someone who has tinnitus. So we wanna know how you perceive the tinnitus impacts you. And then lastly, there'll be a set of tests that you'll do in our sound booth. We'll put your earphones in, we'll give you instructions for each part of the, the testing. Um, and that will give us a lot more information about your hearing status. It will tell us about what your tinnitus sounds like to you. It will tell us about your ability to tolerate sounds in your environment. It will tell us more about how your hearing system is functioning from outside to inside and gives us information about each step of that pathway. Um, and all of that information is really important as we try to decide what together what to help you do going forward and what makes the most sense for you based on all of these factors. So as we're trying to determine uh, what, what your tinnitus sounds like and how it impacts you, there are a lot of different ways that we can do that, a lot of different ways to think about it. So we can be thinking about how loud your tinnitus is to you. We can be thinking about what's what it sounds like in terms of the pitch. 
I would say most people have a tinnitus that they describe as a high pitch sound, um, but we really hear and see things across the whole spectrum. Um, what it sounds like in terms of the quality. So this is something we discussed on the very first slide where people try to describe the type of sound that their tinnitus sounds like. Some people feel like they hear more than one sound um, and we hear a lot of that as well. Lateralization will refer to where you hear the tinnitus. So some people feel like it's in one ear specifically or the other. Some people feel really strongly they hear it in both ears. Some people feel like they hear it in their head or in a specific place in their head. So that's what that refers to. Maskability and suppression is related to how other sounds in your environment interact with your tinnitus. Some people feel like there are sounds in their environment that uh, can completely cover their tinnitus and during those stretches of time they don't hear it and aren't bothered by it. Other people feel like that never happens. So the maskability of your tinnitus is something that we would want to know about. Modification of tinnitus or modulation is something that some people can feel like they can experience if they, um, if they touch the side of their neck or their jaw or their head or turn their head in different directions or move their neck, some people feel like it changes how their tinnitus sounds and some people don't. Residual inhibition is one test that can give us information about how other sounds interact with your tinnitus and whether it's suppressed after that sound goes away. And then lastly, exacerbation is something that we always think about. And that relates to how loud sounds in your environment interact with your tinnitus. Many people feel like they don't at all, and other people feel like their tinnitus is really exacerbated or made to be more intrusive or noticeable after they hear a loud sound in their environment. So those are all things that we're gonna be asking you about. Um, I do like to mention that although we estimate millions of people in our country have tinnitus, most actually do not suffer from it. And that's an important distinction, something that we think a lot about trying to figure out who's bothered by their tinnitus versus who is not. Um, so if you look at this pie chart, we estimate that about 70% of people who, who have tinnitus are people who are simply experiencing it. These are the people who are not bothered by it significantly. When you ask someone if they have tinnitus, if they're like, oh yeah, I've had that for a long time, that's someone who's experiencing tinnitus. Um, the green part of the pie would represent someone who is bothered enough by their tinnitus to seek some sort of medical treatment for it. So these tend to be the people that we see a lot of in our clinic. And then lastly, that orangish red 6% uh, of the pie would represent the percentage of people who are debilitated by their tinnitus. So this would be someone who describes that their tinnitus has an impact on their, just on their ability to sleep, their ability to relax, their ability to concentrate or work or be productive at work or school. It interferes with their social interactions and makes them not want to participate in things. Um, so, so we estimate that about 70% of people who have tinnitus are not bothered by it. And then if you look at this other part, pie chart, the numbers actually are quite similar. So this is related to how big of a problem people feel that their tinnitus is. So the, the two blue parts of the pie are people who indicate that either tinnitus is not a problem or a small problem. Um, the, the green part of the pie would be people who indicate that their tinnitus is a moderate problem. And that actually correlates pretty well with the percentage of people who feel like they need to seek treatment for it. And then lastly, the reddish orange part is, are, are the people who feel like their tinnitus is a big problem. And it makes a lot of sense that these people may be debilitated by it. So these numbers line up very well. So when we see you in our clinic, our goal is to move you from the category of someone who is bothered by their tinnitus into the category of someone who is not bothered by their tinnitus. And there are many ways that we can try to do that. So the, the big thing that distinguishes someone who's experiencing tinnitus from someone who's suffering from tinnitus is their reaction to the tinnitus. So you can have two people who have tinnitus that sounds exactly the same in terms of their description. They could say 10 out of 10 loudness. It sounds like a ringing tone. Uh, nothing ever masks it. No other sounds cover it. Um, and, and it's this loudness level. Um, and you may have very different reactions to that. One person might say, oh yeah, I kind of tune that out. And the other person might feel like it impacts every aspect of their life. So the major difference there is what's happening in other parts of their brain that are causing other brain regions to become involved. So I don't, I'm not gonna go through this whole graphic, but really the takeaway is that there's a part of your brain that regulates your emotional reaction to things. And when that part of your brain kicks in, there are negative emotions that are generated, which then result in a physical body reaction that makes you feel tense and alert. So over time, those reactions can become strengthened if the tinnitus continues to become bothersome, and that can lead to a state of tenseness and alertness that leads people feeling very depleted. 
you feel tired at the end of the day, you just kind of feel like the tinnitus is starting to intrude on every aspect of your life. So our goal is to break that reaction when we see people in our clinic. And the goal, as I mentioned before, is habituation. So habituation is the process of tuning something out. And I have a couple of examples here that I would like to go through with you. So here's my smiling mug. Um, one common example of habituation is the feeling of your glasses on your face. So I'm not wearing them today, but when I took this picture, I was wearing my glasses. Um, most of the time I wear contacts, um, but every now and then I wear my glasses. And on those days, I really feel like I notice them. I physically feel them sitting on the bridge of my nose. I feel the, ear, the pieces sitting on the top of my ears. I feel like I'm seeing the frames um, every time I'm looking at something. And when I first put them on in the, morning, in the morning, I notice it a lot. And then as I go throughout my day, as it becomes something that's consistent, that I'm consistently exposed to, I notice it less and less. And then if I became someone who wore my glasses consistently, I would be likely to not notice them at all. Another example that I like to use is we habituate to the sight of, the, of our noses. So if you take a minute and you close your eye and you kind of look at it like that, there's never a time when you're not seeing your nose. It's just that most of the time you don't go through your day thinking, oh, I wish my nose wasn't in the way of the thing that I'm trying to see. If it's something that's constant and your brain has determined it's unimportant, your brain will develop a blind spot for it. And our goal is to help your tinnitus to move into that category for you over time. So another example is the feeling of your watch on your wrist. Um, eventually I get to a point throughout the day where I do not remember that I'm wearing it because I've completely habituated to the feeling of it. And I have to look down to see if I forgot to wear it. Um, another example is in something that a lot of people mention is the sound of their refrigerator and heating and cooling systems turning on and off. Um, so when you get a new refrigerator, you might feel like that darn thing is so loud. I never noticed my old one before, but if you give it a couple weeks, you'll pro your brain will probably move that new sound into the same category. You hear stories of people who live in Chicago talking about how they don't even notice the sound of the L train anymore, and that might be hard to imagine, but if you're consistently exposed to it, your brain can learn to tune anything out, even something as loud as that. And then lastly, just another sensory stimulus. When you walk into a room, if there's a candle burning, you notice it. You, the smell hits you right away. The longer you're in the room, the less you notice it. So these are just some examples of common things that we habituate to over time. And again, our goal is to help people move tinnitus into that same category. So how do we do that, right? There are a lot of treatments available for tinnitus. Um, many, of, many of the things that you're gonna hear about and read about are not evidence-based, but there are, few, there are a few that we do recommend consistently because the evidence suggests that for most people, they are helpful. And we're gonna go through just a few of these briefly today. So counseling and education is the first thing. Some form of sound therapy is, is another thing we're gonna focus on. There are a lot of other treatments that we're not gonna focus on today um, and probably are best suited to some of the researchers affiliated with the foundation, um, but just know that there are other experimental things out there that are up and coming and potentially really exciting. And for some people, they find that just waiting and, and seeing what happens over time does eventually lead them to that place. So let's first focus on education and counseling. So when we see someone who's suffering from tinnitus, a lot of times we, we start by educating them about more specifics related to where we think their tinnitus is coming from. And I think for a lot of people, that is really empowering. It helps them to know that it, what once was thought of as this scary nebulous thing that nobody had any answers for, we do actually have some answers. And generally it's not a scary thing. Most people who have tinnitus, it's completely benign. Um, so knowing these things and kind of learning some of the, the things related to what our goals are, uh, how their hearing system specifically is working, and how that relates to and, and interacts with the brain systems and the functions that are thought to be generating their tinnitus, this whole process of habituation and how that happens, and then how we're going to use sounds to help them facilitate that. It's really empowering for most people to feel like they just have an understanding of what is happening to them and know that they're taking steps toward improvement. Um, there are also a lot of behavioral therapies that we recommend for people who have tinnitus that help to move them in that direction as well. And there's a lot of good evidence to say that cognitive behavioral therapy specifically is something that can help with tinnitus. So cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT for short is is a type of therapy where people can be taught coping strategies, problem-solving mechanisms. And these things can be employed throughout the day 
if you if you come across situations where the tinnitus becomes particularly intrusive, particularly problematic. So the therapist that you work with can help you to focus on and identify thought patterns that are not helpful, um, unproductive, unrealistic, and change the way that you think about them to correct them. Um, and just really like any chronic issue, tinnitus is something that is great to be addressed with this type of treatment. Um, there is also some evidence that mindfulness-based stress reduction, things like, um, like reframing, um, yoga, uh, meditation, things like that can, that can um, help to facilitate relaxation, reduce stress levels, can really help for all of the reasons that we've talked about as well. And then lastly, there is also some evidence related to acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, which focuses on just helping people to accept that there are certain things that happen in life that are just difficult and they're all part of it. Um, so these are just some, some things that are out there that we know tend to help some people with tinnitus um, and cognitive behavioral therapy specifically is a go-to for us that we recommend in conjunction with our sound therapy as well. So when we say sound therapy, what does that mean? <laughs> there are a lot of ways that we can provide sound therapy to a person who has tinnitus. So we'll just go through some examples here. Masking is covering the tinnitus with another sound. So if we can expose you to some kind of external noise that's loud enough to cover your tinnitus or partially cover your tinnitus, you're not gonna hear it. So I, I think a lot of clinicians think of masking as kind of a Band-Aid. So we know that if you are not hearing your tinnitus, you're, you probably won't be reacting to it. But the problem with masking is that as soon as you remove the masking noise, you're going to hear your tinnitus again. And you're kind of right back to where you started because you have not addressed the root of the problem, which is the reaction. So some people who are not debilitated by their tinnitus or significantly bothered by it might find that masking does help them. But generally the people who have a more, self, more severe self-perceived handicap related to their tinnitus may need more than that. Um, one way to use sound is soothing. So if you're listening to something that you find to be pleasant, you are likely to be less stressed when you hear that sound. And again, that will be a goal for someone who's suffering from tinnitus to reduce stress levels. Contrast reduction. Um, I have a little candle there because the analogy that I like to use is if you're in a very dark room and you light a candle, that candle will seem very bright um, in contrast to the darkness of the room. However, if you walk over to the light switch and you flick it on, even when the candle doesn't change, it's going to seem much less bright because there are other lights in the environment. So in that same way, if you're in a very quiet environment and your tinnitus is the prominent thing that you're hearing, it's going to sound very loud and intrusive to you. Most people say that their tinnitus is most noticeable when they're in a quiet environment. For example, when they're trying to fall asleep at night. By using sounds in your environment, we can reduce the contrast between what you hear in your ears externally and what you hear in your head. So the tinnitus tends to become less noticeable when you're using sounds in the environment to reduce that contrast. Distraction is another way that we can use sound therapy. So if you're using some sort of interesting sound like music, podcast, audiobook, webinar, uh, something like that, generally the tinnitus will not be as noticeable as if you're not distracting yourself away from it. Um, and then lastly, habituation is, is ultimately an end goal. And we use sound therapy to change people's reactions over, to their tinnitus over time. So I think a limitation to the process of habituation is just that, it's a process. So many people who, especially those who are significantly bothered by their tinnitus are hoping for a quick fix. Um, and we would love to provide that to you, but most of the time it's kind of a longer game than that. So to achieve that, out, that outcome of habituation, your brain needs to be exposed to cons consistent, consistent things and you need to have time to change your reactions to them. So I will say that most people that go through our process are helped significantly, but it generally is a process of at least a couple months to usually longer than that. If you stick with it, the odds that you'll improve generally are higher. Hearing aids are another thing that I want to mention. Um, because a lot of times when people have hearing loss and tinnitus, they find that hearing aids are significantly helpful actually for both. And these are just some of the reasons I'll outline here why and how. So some of the things that we talked about, for example, soothing, contrast reduction, distraction, masking noises, stress reduction, these can all be achieved with hearing aids. So if you're hearing other sounds in your environment more easily, you're not going to be working as hard 
um, to overcome that hearing loss and your stress levels will be lower. You're gonna be distracted by other things in your environment. You're not gonna notice the tinnitus as much. Um, and then lastly, auditory stimulation is another goal of using hearing aids. And the thought there is that if there is, if there are pathways in your brain that are not receiving stimulation and input um, from the hearing nerve, the tinnitus generally is going to be generated from your brain to try to compensate for that. So if we're stimulating those pathways with actual sound, your brain has kind of a less op less of an opportunity to, to compensate for that by creating its own sound or generating that tinnitus. There is some evidence that people who have tinnitus, a new onset of tinnitus, who don't do anything over that first stretch of time may still improve. And I think generally that's more applicable to people who are not catastrophically bothered by their tinnitus. So there's some evidence to say that many people experience small improvements in tinnitus over the first four months after they start to experience it. Um, and that generally this is true for, for many people. But when you look at specific people, the outcomes can be pretty variable. So this is not something that we, that we can say will happen to everyone. Um, and we're not really sure how meaningful these improvements are. So we can say small improvements, what does that really mean? We're not really sure. So if you're someone who has had a recent onset of tinnitus and you feel like you wanna do something about it, if you're not catastrophically bothered by it, it's reasonable to say, okay, let's give it a month or two. Let's employ some of these coping strategies that I've learned about and we'll see what happens and kind of reassess in a month or two and we'll go from there. But either way, the best thing to do if you feel like you're not sure or you need some guidance is to contact your UPMC audiologist to discuss what some of your options would be. And again, we have audi audiologists in all of our ENT locations across the city and actually even beyond uh, Pittsburgh proper. So the approach that we use at UPMC is called tinnitus retraining therapy. Um, and the reason we use it is it, it is a combination of two of the things that we know the research says helps the most people. So it's a combination of education and counseling and sound therapy. And those are both things that we've already talked about today. So the goal is to achieve habituation of the emotional reaction to the sound and the body's physical reaction, that tenseness and alertness feeling. So this is, this is the same graphic that I showed you on a previous slide, but previously there were arrows and connections linking all of these things. And now in the place of that, what you see is H's. So H represents habituation. So the goal is to help people habituate their emotional reaction to the tinnitus, their physical body reaction. And then there's a blue H on there that represents habituation of perception. So what that means is most people who are successful in reducing their reactions to tinnitus said that they don't notice their tinnitus as much over time. It becomes less noticeable, their perception of it changes. Um, and all three of these things would be great outcomes for someone who's trying to treat their tinnitus. So this treatment therapy was developed in the, 19, in the late 1980s by, um, by the doctors Yastrebov. There are two of them. This is actually a picture of the three of us when I attended their training session in Columbia, Maryland. Um, and now they teach other people how to employ this type of treatment because uh, when they were doing it themselves, their waiting list was astronomical. So now people all across the country are employing this type of treatment and UPMC is one group that's doing that. So when we look at the research related to what tinnitus retraining therapy can do for people, we see that most people are significantly helped. Um, and I think it can be difficult to pinpoint exactly what aspect of TRT is helpful for people. But what we know is that over time, most people do improve. And the way that we measure that is by using those questionnaires that we talked about and asking people about the, the specific parts of their life that are impacted over time. And generally, we see those impacts decreasing over time. Um, and lastly, before, before we wrap up, I just wanted to briefly mention, there is an association called the American Tinnitus Association, and there are some really great resources that are available for people who have tinnitus, consumers, patients. Um, so the website is ata.org, and I like this patient navigator because it tells you step-by-step step what to do. It says, stay calm, don't panic. We know tinnitus can be concerning, but this is what you should do about it. See your physician, see your audiologist, and know that there are treatment options. So I think this is a, a good resource that you can use yourself or share with others who might be struggling with tinnitus that outlines what to do about it and in what order. Um, and now lastly, just to wrap up before we get to any questions that might be out there, um, I just wanted to sum up some of the takeaways. So tinnitus, as we talked about, may be manageable medically, 
But even if it's not, if the tinnitus is primary, there are treatment options available that do help most people. It can really be a team effort. So we talked about audiologists and physicians. There are a whole host of other providers that we often pull in for some multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary collaboration. So a lot of times people who have tinnitus find that anxiety or depression or other mental health disorders are impacting their ability to cope. So by addressing those aspects, a lot of time it improves those coping skills and makes the tinnitus less intrusive. Um, dentists are a lot of are, are also a group that we work with frequently because we know that issues related to TMJ and um, jaw malocclusion can exacerbate tinnitus. It can cause tension. It can make people feel like their tinnitus really changes and becomes more noticeable. Physical therapists are also people that we work with. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes people who move their head and neck in certain ways find that their tinnitus is modifiable and physical therapists can help to um, develop strategies related to that. Um, so really it can, it can be a team effort um, and often is. So if you come to your audiologist and your ear, nose and throat provider, we can help you to figure out what other team members we need to pull in to address the specific problems that you're having. And then lastly, start with us. Uh, contact your UPMC audiologist to figure out what your treatment options can be after you've gone through this process of evaluation. So again, this is another QR code that you can use and scan with your phone. Um, to pull up all of our audiology locations and the phone numbers where you can reach us directly. So I hope today you have come away with some strategies for managing tinnitus and some rationale behind why we use them. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank everybody for attending today. And I think Carrie from uh, our foundation is going to be fielding some questions for us today. And um, so we'll see if anybody has anything that I can help them with. Thank you, Lori. That was really a great presentation. And um, I appreciate you the way you kind of walked through it um, from, from the start of a process that someone might have in their experience with tinnitus all the way through uh, the coping mechanisms and the resources that um, we can provide, you know, and at UPMC can provide. Um, and it was just a wealth of information. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. We have a few questions and I see some more rolling in uh, now. So we'll get started um, with our first question. And this question starts with, do anti-anxiety and or SSRIs play a role in how you would be able to treat tinnitus? This is a good question because a lot of people, um, or maybe not a lot of people, some people go to their doctor and are, are told that they should consider some sort of medication to help them cope with their tinnitus. And what the evidence tells us related to anti-anxiety medication, antidepressants, is that it's not likely to impact your tinnitus perception directly. So it's not necessarily going to make your tinnitus go away. It's not necessarily going to make your tinnitus loudness change. It's not necessarily going to change the quality of your tinnitus. But what it may do is indirectly improve those coping skills that are going to help to move you from a category of someone who's bothered by their tinnitus into the category of someone who's not bothered by their tinnitus. Um, and what I will say is that when I work with people who are suffering from anxiety and depression, things like that, and they're not managed or not managed appropriately, coping, it, it's a barrier to coping. Um, and I think sometimes people come to us hoping that we can fix everything with education and counseling and sound therapy, and then they won't have to address those issues. And that's generally, it's really not how it works. It really needs to be a multidisciplinary effort to address those things, which we know are barriers to coping. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question that's really interesting. Are there any predispositions to acquiring tinnitus other than working with loud noise? I guess the question meaning, are there any genetic predispositions that would make you more susceptible to getting tinnitus in your lifetime? There's some recent um, research related to this that I, I think is kind of interesting. So there was a group of researchers who were looking at people um, who have tinnitus uh, in one ear, tinnitus in both ears, and looking at some hereditary factors. And what they were able to determine is that there, there likely is a percentage of people who may have tinnitus that's related to hereditary factors, um, like more likely people who have bilateral tinnitus, which means tinnitus in both ears. 
So that would be more likely to be something related to a genetic factor than someone who has tinnitus in one ear and not the other. So it's more thought that people who have tinnitus in one ear and not the other may be more likely to be experiencing that related to um, some sort of anatomical condition or maybe some sort of um, experience in their life um, related to noise exposure maybe, um, but some sort of event that would be linked to the onset of that tinnitus. Um, but there is thought to be a, a percentage of people with bilateral tinnitus that where, where that um, onset can be attributed to hereditary factors. I think something that also maybe compound, compounds that a little bit is that we know that hearing loss can have genetic factors as well. Um, and we know that hearing loss is a risk factor for tinnitus. So I'm not sure that we can entirely separate that out right now. Um, but I guess the short answer is that yes, it's thought that there may be a, a hereditary component, especially to bilateral tinnitus. I hope that answers the question. It does. And, um... You know, I'm sure that there's, re I think that there is research going on, like you said, uh, within our own institution about that. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, can you speak about if um, barometric pressure would have any impact on tinnitus? We do see a lot of people in our clinic after um, flying, especially on an airplane, or experiencing pressure changes, traveling or doing certain activities who feel like they have new onsets of hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, there is some thought that maybe hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be a potential treatment for tinnitus. I will say that the research seems to be kind of mixed in this area. Um, and again, I would say a lot of times when we see people in our clinic for those issues, there are also hearing issues that are associated with that that we, that we can't necessarily separate from the tinnitus. So when you're exposed to changes in um, pressure in the air, it changes how your middle ear works. So there, there's a mechanism that's supposed to help to equalize pressure between the middle part of your ear and the outer part of your environment. And that is your eustachian tube. And when it's not working well, you can develop pressure issues in the middle ear, which can, which can lead to hearing loss, which can lead to the perception of the tinnitus. Um, so I would say it definitely can be something that, that is related to that. Really interesting, thank you. Um, speaking about hearing aid devices, um, you said that those can help uh, modify tinnitus and help retrain your brain mm -hmm. uh, to kind of cope with the tinnitus that you have. Are there any specific types of hearing aids, brands of hearing aids that you recommend or tend to uh, work better to kind of modulate the tinnitus that you're experiencing? I love this question. Thank you for asking it. It's an area that I think a lot about and am, um, is near and dear to me. So um, part of the sound therapy process for many people involves on-ear devices. So when there's hearing loss, we can do a combination device. So the device will act as a hearing aid and we can also activate what's called a tinnitus sound generator. So it's one device that has both capabilities and the, um, the role of the tinnitus sound generator, which is generally just a low level of noise that's present in the background, is to one, change how the tinnitus sounds to you, to try to kind of mix or blend with the tinnitus, but also make it less noticeable. We don't want it to get so loud that we feel like you're interfering with your ability to hear, which if you have hearing loss would already be something that we're already worried about. Um, but really those two things, the hearing aid and the tinnitus sound generator can work together in a lot of really good ways to help people move toward acceptance and coping. Um, in terms of whether there are certain styles or technology levels or manufacturers that are better than others, I would say it's really about the person who's fitting the device rather than the device itself. So many of the hearing aids that are available today, if you look from one manufacturer to another, are going to be really comparable. So they're going to have similar features. They're going to have um, similar ways that things are set up and similar ways that you're going to access the different settings. Many, many phones nowadays can be, or many hearing aids nowadays can be directly connected to your mobile smartphone. So you can, that's a nice feature because you can use that to access your tinnitus sound generator and make settings um, that are specific for certain environments that you think are helpful for your tinnitus. You can have different programs, volume changes, you know, all of these things are accessible to you then on your phone. Um, so that would be a question to ask your audiologist just about what features are available with different styles of hearing aids and different models of hearing aids. 
Um, I will say that the ones that are really, really small that go all the way down into your ear canal are nice because they're not as noticeable um, in terms of how they look, but when, it's a trade-off there. So if you get something really, really small, you're, you're kind of trading away the capability for some of those additional features that a lot of people like. Um, so that can be something that your audiologist talks about with you in terms of those trade-offs and what you think is most important to you. Um, but many people with hearing loss and tinnitus like the capability of having a combination device, which is a hearing aid and a tinnitus sound generator. For people who, this is kind of a long answer, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a good question with a, a long answer. For people who have tinnitus but no hearing loss, a similar device can be something that's also used, except in this case, we would not activate the hearing aid feature because we don't, you wouldn't need it. So you would have consistent to that, or you have you would have um, exposure to that consistent sound on your ear that's gonna help you to cope with your tinnitus and make it less noticeable, but you wouldn't need amplification of those environmental sounds. Um, so there are many audiologists who are really comfortable working with hearing aids. And I would say most audiologists have a basic um, capability to work with tinnitus sound generators as well. If you want someone who's really specialized in this area, then that could be something that you're asking your audiologist about as well. So whether it's them or someone that they wanna to refer to or collaborate with, that could be something you're thinking about. That was a long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a really great answer. I think you know many of our audience members might be interested if they are looking to um, kind of come into the clinic and see what their options are. We'd like to know that in advance. Um, speaking of coming into the clinic and seeing an audiologist, if someone has tinnitus and they are able to get by and tolerate it fairly well, do they still need to see an audiologist, um, you know, for for other reasons, for health reasons, for you know, just to to be monitoring the tinnitus? Usually, when people have tinnitus, we do recommend a hearing test because we know that over time, when people develop age-related hearing loss, a lot of people do not know that they have it. Um, so part of the, the welcome to Medicare visit, when you, when you turn that age and you start to move toward that, um, that type of coverage is they recommend hearing evaluation. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is because a lot of people do not know that they have hearing loss, um, and tinnitus may be something that kind of cues you into that. And again, a lot of people who have tinnitus don't have hearing loss, but it's good to just be monitoring any changes in hearing that might be occurring, even if they're small changes and more data points are always better than fewer. So I think if you've never had a hearing test, especially, it's a great idea to get a baseline. And then many people will follow up with, with um, future testing in a year or two years or whatever the recommendation will be based on what your initial results are. So I do think it's, like I said, more data points are always better than fewer. And if we, if we have more of them, we can monitor small changes if they occur and then be thinking about how we can catch any potential problems early before they lead to larger problems. Maybe a specific question, um, but it's something I've never heard of. Uh, what is lipoflavonoid? And do you think it has an impact on treating tinnitus? So that would fall into the category of one of those other treatments that I mentioned. Okay. So it's, it's a supplement essentially um, that a lot of uh, companies will, will market as though it helps with tinnitus. What the research says is that there's no, there's no good quality evidence to say that it is going to remove your tinnitus or reduce your tinnitus. But what I will say is that every treatment that's out there has probably helped at least one person. So if you ask, and this is always a question to ask your physician, um, because I'm not a physician, so I can't really make comments about medications or supplements and things. But usually my guess would be that they would say something like, it probably won't hurt you. It might not help you. Um, there's really not good evidence either way. So if this is something you're think about, thinking about, ask your physician before you do it. more questions, um, but please, uh, I want to say to the audience, if you continue to have questions, they haven't been asked, we will make sure to get them uh, to Dr. Zatelli and, uh, and answers can be written and shared with you via email. So please continue to ask questions, but we want to, you know, kind of keep to, to our time slot. Um, have you seen over the last two years, any evidence that COVID can, um, can cause tinnitus in some people? This is a hard question to answer. So there have been a lot of research articles over the last couple of years that have been published looking specifically at otolaryngology problems 
linked to COVID. Um, and there's a pretty wide range of what they've reported in terms of people reporting tinnitus. So if you look at one study, it says 1% of people with a COVID-19 diagnosis have tinnitus. If you look at another study, it says 23% had it. So I think probably the answer is somewhere in between in that range. Um, but it's a good question that I don't think we know the answer to yet. And I think there's still a lot that we need to learn about the longer term impacts of COVID-19 as well. Um, and I will just add on, a lot of people have been asking about the COVID-19 vaccine related to tinnitus. And there, there are a few studies looking specifically at this. Um, and in most cases reported in the case reports, the tinnitus did um, subside following the, the administration of the vaccine. Um, and there is a vaccine ad adverse event reporting system online that, that's maintained. Um, there are a lot of disclaimers saying that the data are not complete and you can't use them to make any interpretations. But if you look at the numbers um, and then compare them to the number of doses that have been administered, um, the, num the percentage of people reporting tinnitus in that database are, is very small. Um, so I, I guess the short answer is we don't know definitively. And I think we're going to see more research in this area over the next you know, period of time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can understand why you when it's still kind of new and, and, and results can vary. Um, is there a link between tinnitus and migraines? There can be. Um, so that's another one of those things where it's, it's not at the top of the list of risk factors, but a lot of times when we see people who have tinnitus, they report um, dizziness, migraines, uh, especially, uh, or maybe after a head injury, um, or some sort of specific event. So there, there certainly can be. I think if someone is experiencing a migraine, all, a lot of their cognitive resources are being expended in certain directions, which may then lead to tinnitus seeming more bothersome. So that kind of goes back to that pie chart that we talked about there. We'll look at one more question. Um, do you need a referral from your PCP to see an audiologist, either at UPMC or any other healthcare system? So the testing that we complete in our clinic is billed to insurance, and the hearing test will be covered if, there a if there's a physician order. So this can be any physician. It can be your primary care doctor. It can be any sort of specialist. There just needs to be an order from the physician to have the testing covered. And then beyond that, we can try to determine what would be most appropriate for you. Thank you so much. I think um, we'll get to the rest of the questions via email. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Zatelli, for such a great presentation again. I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, on the web today on the, on, uh, for this Sight and Sound Bites webinar. Um, as always, please uh, look at our website, www.eyeandear.org, for any information on upcoming webinars and other events um, related to hearing loss, vision loss, and other conditions uh, of the eye and ear. And I hope everybody has a great Friday. I think we'll end the, the Sight and Sound Bites webinar here. So thank you, Dr. Zatelli. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you at our next webinar in two weeks. Thank you.